Karelia. Karelia is one of the most unusual regions in Russia. In its history it has been a county of Novgorod, a duchy in the Swedish kingdom and even a labor commune. In this video I will show you rock paintings that are at least 5000 years old and there are even erotic scenes. We will see the island of Kiji, one of the main reserves of the old Russian wooden architecture and the huge Anega lake. We will see the White Sea and Solovki. We will also compare Soviet and Finnish constructions in the border towns. We will pick Karelian berries and meet alpacas. This year Karelia has become one of the top destinations for tourism in the European part of Russia. As soon as the coronavirus restrictions were eased, tourists floated into Karelia. Probably half of my friends have been there this summer and people choose this region for a reason. This spring I had planned to go on a camping trip to enjoy Russian nature and I did, but in autumn. The government of the Republic of Karelia invited me for a four-day trip. Petrozavodsk is the capital city of Karelia. The city was built on the site of an arms factory which was founded by Peter the Great in 1703. Workers started to settle around it and soon a small settlement with a population of a few thousand people was formed here. In 1777 it was given a town status. Karelia and Petrozavodsk are very close to Finland. Locals often visit Finland and its influence is quite strong here, including in relation to come historical buildings. For example, in the center of Petrozavodsk there are quite a lot of old wooden buildings. They aren't demolished like in other regions. Of course they had a lot of problems with demolishing, but buildings have been saved. They are looked after, cared for and they look good. You can see the wooden architecture even in the city center. This is what we enjoy in Finnish cities too. As we know, wooden architecture is respected in Finland. We don't appreciate it in Russia. Here they call them rotten wood piles and they rather tear them down. So it's surprising that there are wooden houses in Petrozavodsk and some of them even look good. Here's an old church that's rather interesting and it's interesting not only because of its beautiful wooden building, but there is also an amazing old pre-revolutionary cemetery. These crosses are old. As we were told, they were all raised 10 years ago, repaired, painted and cleaned and as a result the old cemetery is preserved in the wood. I think it's an interesting sightseeing spot. Look, here we have a usual house with wooden too. Look how small and plain is this tiny house with white window frames and old roof, but it looks rather nicer than a modern block of flats just behind it. It's a sweet little house. It would be nice if they build a proper road here. Here we have an old post boxes, another stunning old house with cool gates, cool frames. I think it's a museum. Lazarev House, a cultural heritage site. We just happened to be in for a great event, the replacement of the pavements. The only thing I don't really understand is how people are going to walk during these works. For some reason they don't offer any temporary solution. Alright then, it would be nice if they would also remove all those strange fences. For some reason people in Petrozavodsk like strange fences and they are everywhere. Now we go on and see that they are all different. As we know fences are completely useless elements in urban environment, not only do they spoil the view but they are also dangerous. You see here is the fence, here is a different one and there is a third one starting there. I hope that the mayor of Petrozavodsk will watch this video and decide to make the city even better. And the first thing to do is to remove these useless stupid fences. And next, friends, we have this stunning old Russian sauna called Banya building. There's a competition among them here. Look, there's a sauna called Steam here and there's the Olympus sauna. There you go. I don't know how great the saunas are, but the fact that they are in the Soviet pre-war building that remain to this day is great. Talking about the influence of the neighborhood in Finland, I really wish that you would see paving stones or some cool historical details that we have not yet found. Maybe we will see something like that soon. 
Here's a historical fence, by the way. Just as I was talking about architectural details, and here it is. Here we are looking at an old fence. I don't know if it is a pre-war or post-war one. There's a three-story building, but just look at this fence and all of its details. It seems that the fence over here was in bad state, so they decided to restore it in a way they're familiar with. And this is how they do it today. It's a perfect example of degradation. It's strange why they couldn't repeat a simple fence, why they had simplified. There's an old lamp post inside here, and you don't see many like this one now. The lantern itself is new, but the construction that's not particularly beautiful is still an important historical detail. They are really used to be lamp posts like this one before. It's a simple, inexpensive construction that adjusts welded angles that go up like this, thinning towards the top. Lamp posts like this were put in Petrozavodsk because there was no money for the luxurious ones, which could be put in central streets of Moscow, St. Petersburg and other cities, but here, in the courtyards, there were simpler lampposts. And the fact that it has survived is very cool. This is the main pier of Petrozavodsk, from where the motorboats depart for Kiji and other places of interest. Ticket for Meteor Speedboat costs $39 for adults for a round trip and $30 one way. But why would we need a one way ticket? We can't stay there overnight, so you have to get a return ticket. So it costs $23.40 for children under 16 and $39 for adults. Wow! To go to Valaam it will be 79 bucks for adults and 60 for children. But we are looking for Kiji, which is 39 there and back by Meteor. And another aid for the entrance ticket there. People sometimes say that I don't praise Russia often enough. Actually, this is not true. It is very difficult to admire the outskirts of Omsk, for example, when you walk knee-deep in mud and there is only despondency and gloom all around you. But that doesn't mean that there is nothing wonderful about Russia. Sometimes you come to a place and realize how amazing it is. Let's take a trip to the Kiji Island. It is a place where the original wooden Russian architecture has been preserved, with its special atmosphere and incredible landscapes. On Kiji Island there are many historical and religious constructions which have survived the Soviet period without serious destructions. Kiji Church has been recognized as an architectural monument back in 1920s, so the churches weren't plundered and exploded, icons and ornaments weren't taken away and sold, in addition to the existing churches, chapels, houses and other interesting buildings were brought here from all over Karelia. The island is small, just 5.5 kilometers long, the widest part is 800 meters long. The church, by the way, was built in the narrowest and very inconvenient place. Our pearl, Kiji churchyard, has always been situated on this island. In modern Russia, the word of churchyard Pogost refers to an old abandoned cemetery, but in the ancient times Pogost was a central village and usually there were two churches and a bell tower. Why are the two churches? One church is enough for prayers, no? But our ancestors always wanted the church to be something special. And they certainly knew how to build one. They're tall, they're very impressive, but they couldn't use them here in the winter time. It's too cold here and it's difficult to heat such a large building. That's why there is a tradition to put a small heated winter church next to big unheated summer church. Ah, great, here's Vitaly Skopin, he has a lot of stories about restoration process. Hi, what do you do here? I'm deputy director of restoration, restorer and client. That's great. And I'm the restorer, Vitaly Skopin. Our guys work here. 
The Church of the Transfiguration was built in 1714. It was built on the site of an earlier hip church that was burned down by a lightning strike. Throughout its history, the church was closed many times for repairs and restorations. The first renovation took place less than half a century after its completion, and later it was repaired a few more times. Sometimes the works were so serious that it changed the overall appearance of the church. The most recent major renovation began in 2009 and was completed in 10 years. The point is that by that time, the church had been in a state of disrepair for decades and some of the timbers had rotted away almost completely. Because of that, the building had sagged badly and was at risk of collapse. The locks were raised and hung on special metal structures. These allowed the craftsmen to dismantle and restore the rotten sections. The work done is amazing. It's not very often in Russia that one finds an example of a truly high-quality restoration. What is genuine and what is new here? The ends of the logs that look old, they are from early 18th century. The ends that look clean, that's what we did. There's almost 70% of old material that's been preserved. So this one here is old and this one above is new. Yes. And this is brand new? Yes, they're a bit different in color now, it usually takes a long time to even out the color of the wood inside, but outside you have to inspect it again after a few years. There is no progression here? No. Look at the quality of the work. This log is clearly an original one from 1714. Do you see the log facing? Legend has it that it was done by the craftsman Nestor who built the church. The one who built the church with an axe and threw it into the lake after? Yes, and the great, great, great grandson did this one and now he needs to replicate Nestor's cutting. Can you tell which is which? This looks amazing. If you look closely at the centers of these trees, the density of wood is such that if you count number of rings, the pine's about 220 years old. So, the church itself is about 300 years old, and the trees have been grown for another 250 years before that. So, tell me about this perimeter firefighting system. Yes, uh, so it is a dry pipe, which was made for the period of restoration of the Church of Transfiguration and in general it provided fire exhaustion just in case. That's the water underneath, isn't there? There's a dry pipe, there's a pumping station and a fireboat on the other side. There's a fireboat of Ministry of Emergency Situations, which can extinguish the fire in case of any accidents. There is an iconostasis here. Four icons were restored by our Russian craftsmen. It looks like the historical one and not like newly built one. It's very important. This is the iconostasis and the whole decor, everything is made out of wood. You are looking at the layers of the 18th and 19th century, which is important because we couldn't adjust the project to the match and specific date, but the main goal was to keep as much of historical materials as possible. Is this a safety roof here? Yes, this is it from the inside and now we are going upstairs. Here you can see just the 19th century planks which have been preserved. We can't turn them over, but there are marks from that period on the inside. And here is the perfect work that Vitali and his colleagues did. It is practically impossible to tell the difference. Friends, we are in the dome of Church of the Transfiguration. Its diameter is 5 meters and it's the largest dome among all wooden churches in Russia. There is so much space you can live here. And there is a window in it that you can look through, which gives a stunning view of the surroundings. Unfortunately, this view is not available for tourists, so now you will have such a unique experience. Only the restorers and museum staff come here, but they kindly let us in. Oh, it's hard! As someone who once put together an IKEA wardrobe, I don't think I'd have any trouble closing the hatch. Are you sure it's from around here? Oh my! Do not swear in the house of the Lord. 
I think that's a necessary piece. No, there's no such thing. I think I'm stuck here. Are there any historical available things in here? All of it. If I press the wrong thing, the whole church will come down like a house of cards. Done. History event. I can write a manual now. This is the first time a man with crooked hands has been able to close this hatch. Friends, I'm going down an ancient ladder. It may even be from the 18th century. There's a board with semicircular holes on it, like steps. And I want to tell you that this ladder is so much more comfortable than the modern ones. It's very comfortable to walk up. They wanted to take it away to a museum, but those who work here insisted and it stayed here. There's another hatch here, we'll close it now. Switch off the lights when you leave the house. Today Kiji is not just a church, but a whole museum of wooden architecture. For example, here there is a peasant hut of the 19th century that was specially brought here. In addition to the church in Kiji, there are many old huts which were transported to the island from other villages. In one of them there is a museum allowing to plunge into the life of the past centuries. Here you will be shown how Karelian peasants lived and you will learn to bake traditional pies or simply be treated to these pies. So here's a hut. This is the place where the hostess used to cook food for lunch, for breakfast, for dinner, all at once, early in the morning. Whoa, what is this? Chiburvex, those deep-fried turnovers? It's a traditional dish. You're not the first to ask if it's Chiburvex. It's a traditional dish for the rich, baked on a white flour called Ketimpira or wedding pies, pies for a son-in-law. It was the kind of a pies that were always cooked in every home at least once a year or during the time when the bride was getting married. Wait, do you know the Vepsian language? Fluently. Can you say in Vepsian subscribe to the channel and like the video? Awesome. It's like a sweet chiburek without the stuffing. It's similar to Twiglets. Let's go over it again. Is it Suchinese? It's just a flat bread that's just fried in a pan, without oil, without anything, and inside is just a lean porridge. We can use all sorts of cereal for porridge. Tell me, so you have this house, can any tourist come here or what? You have a tour option at the ticket office and you can order it in advance. So you can say at the ticket office that you want to have a workshop in decorating or something like that and just come over here and you will feed them and make them tea? Yes. How much does it cost? The tour with tea is $4 and with the workshop is 5.2. Per person? Yes. So you pay $4 and you eat as much as you want? We offer two pies and a sweet pie each, two kalitkas, Karelian pastry and a pie. And for 5.20 you can have a workshop as well? Yes, you can taste and learn everything. You can take them away with you, of course, and taste them. Friends, it's just an incredible place. I've never been here before. This is the first time in Kiji and it's just crazy how beautiful it is. It's impossible to describe. It's sheer delight. These ancient temples, which are hundreds of years old, these logs, this amazing work of restorers who have saved it all, literally, bit by bit, with such attention and love. All this history, all the events that took place here, the nature is just breathtaking here too. This is a case when there is an incredible creation of nature and the person, in my opinion, has made this place even better. I mean, usually, I always say that the man comes and spoils everything, but here a man was able to create a true miracle that can compete with the miracle of this stunning nature around. It's just utter delight. I'm sad, I have lived for 36 years and I have never been here before just to look at the fence here. These old lynching covered stones, these paths and the lake shore, it's an incredible looking shore. 
There is the clearest water in the lake. It's just some kind of real-life miracle, a miracle of nature and a miracle made by a man. It's very beautiful. I like how delicately they've done everything here. You see the path is just covered with gravel and that's it. There is there are no tiles, no fences, and there's ducks walking around. This grass is trimmed. There is nothing to stop you from admiring this beauty, this wooden church. We are now near a rock on which the ancient people knocked out the image of bunnies. Actually, it's not the ancients, it is Sergei Gavanovich. He will come now and tell us more about this wall. But it's actually a very good precedent where the new point of attraction is created. Russians very bad at it. We actually are good at taking pride in and selling some historical legacy, an ancient temple or some natural wonders. But to do something new, to do something from the ground up that would be a cool attraction that is worth going to see is extremely rare. In this case, this site with bunnies is just awesome. You should come here to have a look and take pictures. We are going to discuss with the author how it could be done here. How did this all happen? Accidentally, as usual. How many bunnies are there? Now with 600, it's going to be 1,000. 1,000 bunnies? Did you do this all by yourself? With people. A person can visit the website, support the project that covers some expenses. Before the pandemic, I did it on my own money. And what's the fate of this all now? Every bunny has a number and it's assigned to someone so you can even go to the website to see whose it is. So you can have your own bunny here? How much does it cost? Around 65 bucks. So you can have a bunny for 65 bucks? Yes, for many centuries. How long does it take to make one hair? Just do job without preparation, an hour and a half. How long have you been doing all this for? It's my third year doing this. The authorities aren't helping you now? No, not at all. But nonetheless, locals here who deal with tourism told us right away that we should come here. This has already become a new tourist attraction. Look, it's free. It's unique for Russia. It's unique for the world. Because you won't find anything like this anymore. It was important for me that it was free. It is very expensive to travel in Karelia. I mean, you get to one place, to another, to the third one. In the end, it turns out to be a lot. We counted and it's cheaper for us to go elsewhere. And the inscriptions were here before, right? No, they started appearing recently. Some fools drew something last year. But I found a Karelian witch and she cursed everyone and everything. <laughs> The best protection against vandals is to find a Karelian witch who curses everyone. Dear Lena, I don't know who you are, but for some reason Stas devoted to you first. Then some bunny, which means it looks like your partners are changing. Please, there's not enough space here for all your partners. There are no other bunnies here. Find yourself another rock. Sergey, can you carve out a bunny for Lena so that they'll settle down and stop? No, I can only make a gravestone for Lena. They've stole all my planks. There was scaffold here, there were planks, now there is nothing. Oh dear. Another thing about all these inscriptions is that if a normal, decent girl sees that her boyfriend drew something as bad, she will tell him to go straight away. So this whole vandalism story is strange. And here we have a hair with a skull on it. It's a warning for vandals. I first thought it was just glued here or made of concrete. But no, it was all carved into the rock. You can even touch the inside here. It's amazing work. Kuzovar Hipilago consists of 16 small islands in the White Sea near the town of Kem. People come here to hike, to fish and to have a rest on the seashore, to swim, go scuba diving and see monuments of ancient Sami. We have landed on a German island, opposite is a Russian island. But it is better not to go there, since like any Russian place shoot, there are bears living there. We observed six climatic zones on this island during the trip, almost. Below you can see green meadows, these are zones where succulents grow. This is a plant that can feed on salt water. And below is a zone of where edibles grow, things that we add 
to salads, sea parsley, sea onion, golden root, peas, willow herb. Everything is edible in these coastal meadows. Then naturally you see an area of taiga, i.e. forests that are mostly spruce. In places that are sheltered by winds, all the way over there, there are deciduous groves, which means that you get into the climate of the middle zone as well. Under your feet on the granite, there are lichens. This is what the Arctic tundra looks like. You can see such stands of crooked wood and it looks like forest tundra, but it's not. And there are also green glades everywhere. When we will ascend, there will be more of them. It reminds of tundra. So it is such a unique archipelago, which concentrates a lot of beauty in one place. When they made an expert assessment on these islands, according to the assessment, 42% of territories here on the archipelago are of the highest category of aesthetic value. I didn't even know that such a thing exists. It means that everywhere you turn, it's very beautiful. Have we climbed 70 meters up? About that, about 60 meters, I think. We will be going up this way. It's 126 meters up there. There are some stairs along the way and there will be two places where we will have to use physical strength. I hope no one has a fear of heights. Let's go for the excitement. Here we have our dear Kier climbing up. Kier, why aren't you filming? Can't you climb and film at the same time? It's always harder for the cameraman because while we are enjoying this beauty, they choose the right camera angle. Further up here, the path is quite narrow, so hold on to the rock with your right hand and shift your center of gravity here and walk normally. I don't see any particular height fear in Kier's eyes. Uh, it's a brown cap belitus. Wonderful mushroom. Come and pick mushrooms with us. There is plenty of such goodies here. No one picked them. Even the tourists downstairs are bored with mushrooms. Let's go to the highest point. Careful, it's slippery here. Watch your step. Well, that's it. The highest point here. From here we have almost all around view. The Russian island is a bit higher, but there is deep taiga, it's impossible to get through. Brown bears live there. Wow, two of them. What can you see from here? You can see the coastline, Camp Town, and the northernmost part of it, northern Rombak. Nearest to us is Tuparuki and this set of archipelagos and with Cam Sea Cliffs. And there are 24 kilometers of islands. To the north there is the open part of the sea the White Sea Basin. There is a long chain of islands in one line. This is Solovetsky Archipelago. It is 24 kilometers far from here. We are exactly in the middle between Kam and Solovki now. And if you look to the southeast, there is such a long strip of land over there. Zhuzhmu Islands, which are 45 kilometers away. So even in a bad light, the visibility is 45 kilometers from the highest point from here. Solovetsky Islands, or simply Solovki, are the most famous Russian archipelago. Humans stepped on this earth as far back as 600 years before Christmas. In the 15th century, a monastic settlement appeared here, and a hundred years later, the islands were used as a place of exile. In 1920, the Red Army liquidated the monastery, and later, the Solovetsky Special Purpose Camp appeared here. For 10 years of camp existence, 7.5 thousand people died here. This is an average of two people a day. Religious activity returned to Solovki in 1990, and two years later the islands were among the first in Russia to be included in the UNESCO World Heritage List. They were surpassed only by the center of St. Petersburg, the Kremlin and the Kizhi Island that we have already visited. By the way, until 1930, Solovetsky Islands were part of Karelia, but then they joined in Arhangelsk region, to which they belong now. This construction here in the north is called Seid. Seid is a Sami word. Seida is a spirit. 
to the Sami, like pagans, believed the stones were animated. There were over 800 of them found here. It's one of the largest clusters of these constructions. And distinctive feature of these seeds is principle of unstable equilibrium. That is, if we were to dig out this pebble from here, it would simply roll down. That's the trick. We don't know what it is, or why, so you see the principle of unstable equilibrium. Why on this archipelago there are so many stone buildings? Because look there, you see Selovki? It is the richest hunting and fishing grounds on the region, as a matter of fact. The development of the White Sea began in the west from that side. So when people were sailing coaster, they reached this point, it is the last point before going to open sea. And before dangerous travel, it's very dangerous there, it is the White Sea. It is the basin of the third category of difficulty, and so sacrifices were made. So they put up an altar, roughly speaking, and made food sacrifices, fat, bones of seals, fish and so on. That is why they've done it here, because it is the extreme point in relation to the open sea and the seal of Kim. If somebody needs a rope, we'll go by the rope. Although it's not that sharp, so you can go by foot all. Plus, it's not far to fall. There is really nowhere to fall. Oh, there he is! There is the hair running. There he sits by the rock. That's why I filmed the bear. I felt the bear standing behind me. I turned around and turned on the camera. He stood there on that rock and went, ooh. And then he climbed up that one, ah. And what could I do? Confused. I didn't know what to do. He went down and swam past over there. And I forgot to press record at first. And when he swam, I press record so I have a video. There was a flock of ducks swimming. He went towards them, but they were swimming away. Was he swimming fast? The government was strong, but he wasn't swimming fast. Could a man swim away from a bear? Well, I don't know. I don't know. If he gets scared, he'll swim away. He wants to live. That's a terrific hut there. Yeah, it's a surveyor's hut from the 50s. It was filmed in the movie Young Russia. This is where Lomonosov was whipped, and this hut was actually in the frame. This is where people dry seaweed for themselves, you see. You can come here with a tent. Yes, this is a nature preserve that has territories for tourism and recreation development. This is a separate project in Karelia, and we ran a part of the territories. We are involved in this project and we organize tours and other things here on the island. Plus, we organize camping sites and there are toilets. For example, this camp is actually stationary. You can buy yourself a tour program, come here for five or seven days. There are tents here and you will be given a sleeping bag. There is a mobile sauna, there are cooks who will make you three meals a day. And how much does it cost? It varies, but on average it's $325 per person for a week. So you can live here and swim in the White Sea? Yes, of course you can swim. The only thing that is difficult to develop tourism in this legislative situation so far. We are bearing all burdens. We pay rent, we do fire protecting, cleaning on island and so on. So we both pay rent and develop tourism. We would like not to pay rent, for example. If the state would somehow loosen this mechanism, I think such territories would become very popular. So far, there are these difficulties, but we are working with them. It's okay. Oh, Victoria, can we jump in? We are in a small village on the White Sea, Rabocha Ostrovsk. It is this village that became part of the film The Island. Behind me there is a set. The film crew searched for a long time for a small abandoned skip. Eventually they found it. There was an observation tower and a barn which have been turned into a church. There are no domes or crosses now. But this is actually a set left over from the film. They filmed here 15 years ago and it's still there. And if you have seen the film The Island, you'll recognize these places. And so this place has become another attraction, a tourist magnet, because even filming locations, film sets, may also be a tourist sightseeing spot. So if you happen to come to Rabochastrovsk, or if you suddenly decide to swim to Solovki, or look at some neighboring islands, find time to come here 
and talk about really stunning views. And the locals have made a bridge, a bench, a table here. You can probably have a picnic. Someone left a small BBQ there. All in all, this place is incredibly beautiful and cool. And one of the famous attractions of this small village. In the locality of Zalaraga, near Bilomorsk, it is possible to see petroglyphs. Petroglyphs of ancient people. Their age is estimated at five to six thousand years. They are some of the first works of art. Local petroglyphs were discovered twice. The first time was in 1936, when the expedition found 216 separate drawings. And then in 2005, thanks to a new method of research, many new figures were discovered. In the end, it turned out that there were many more petroglyphs. Of course, if there is an interaction between man and animal shown, it is predominantly the man like to carve out the tactics of haunting this or that animal. Here we can see an autumn haunting in water. For example, here you see a boat, the head of the totem animal, presumably an elk, then comes the keel, the hull itself and in this case humans are depicted as sticks. That is the hunting during the migration. A certain group of people trace the herd and understand that in this area the animals will cross the waterway. They call a settlement, line them up along the bank of this river, but when the animals enter this river, the people start chasing them down the river and people start hunting these animals. It is easier to hunt ungulates in water than to chase a deer or an elk through a forest all summer and not catch them. One of the most famous in the world, these three archers are the oldest images of archers in the world. We see three hunters and the last one and the one next to it have a hunter's backpack. But the first hunter doesn't. The thing is that the first hunter is a younger hunter, who is trained to hunt sea and the forest animals. He doesn't deserve this rucksack. So he goes ahead and tramples the path. There is a white whale in the sea and just here we see a beluga whale, its tail, trunk and fins, and the beluga whale child, here it is, its tail, trunks and fins, a small one. This scene is interesting because it is of a natural slope, while the very structure of these belugas whipping resembles scales. But of course the white whale has no scales, and here it is for the artwork. And during the rains, this puddle overflows and water begins to run down the white whale. Due to its texture, it should create an impression that beluga whale comes to life and starts moving. Those are ancient human animations, cartoons. Shall I show you an intercourse of two people? Yes, of course. First, there is a tree, branches down, that is the herringbone, and under the tree there are two people. The first one had torso, leg, arm, and the second one had torso, leg, arm. And they are connected by the sexual organ, that is love under the tree. And here is the scene of the conception of the child. In its straight line there are two pregnant women. And further, in a straight line there is a woman who is given birth. The woman is shown as a given birth. Below is another person depicted head, torso, leg, and arm reaching out to this woman. The woman here is in labor. So friends, we got to Kastamuksha. It is quite a big town with 30,000 residents. It's almost on the border with Finland. You can feel the Finnish influence here. In the 1970s, Soviet Union together with Finland started to build the mining and processing plant on this territory, and the settlement around it received the status of a town in 1983, and was called Kastamuksha. Finns had a hand in building not only the plant, but also town itself. So now we can see here Finnish streets with good architecture and good roads. Unfortunately, one cannot say the same about Russian streets. Behind my back there are two houses. One house is Finnish, the other is Russian. It's a typical house built from panel blocks. And you can see the difference very clearly, even though they were built approximately at the same time, and the Russian one was actually built a bit later than the Finnish as I know, you can see very well that the Finnish house is clean and neat, just like abroad, something foreign to us. And we have our regular nine-story building, which looks very bad. Why so? What is the magic? I hope Kastamuksha will help us to answer this question. 
Here's the central square and there's the house of culture, which again, as you can see right away, was built by the Finns. How is it obvious? First of all, because this is all panel constructions. You can see that there are the panels out of which all this was built. You can see that for some reason the Finns have small joints in between panels. And if you compare it with our nine-story building and look at these Finnish houses, you see that the Finns have three times fewer joints. Even panel constructions looks nicer because of that. Then, for some reason, the Finns have these concrete panels for 50-40 years and they still look clean and neat. With us, however, everything is shabby. Some shabby balconies, panels with leak edges, and so these houses look completely untidy, completely different to the Finnish ones. Here again you can see these Finnish houses which look very good. Look, we are coming up close and you can see that all the window frames are still the original ones. It's amazing. All the windows, all the frames, everything is original. They've got a 1.5 cm joint between the panels and the panel itself looks great with the tiles. If we talk about the layout, this is a standard neighborhood which is very similar to Zelenograd because the houses are far away from each other, the town is green, there are a lot of parks, trees and lawns. Now, of course they don't do that now, but back in 70s it was a worldwide practice and Finns follow it too. There are a lot of these type districts in Finland and they are very similar to the ones here. Because they were made at the same materials and they were made just as nice. So in this way Kastamuksha is somewhat of a Finnish town. Look, there's a gym here. As always it's clean and tidy. Reality check. We turned around and saw that we aren't in Finland after all. There's really creepy public transport stop here. It's shabby, with some kind of advertising, crooked and slanted. Can you imagine if a Finn comes up here feeling like they're home and then BOOM! No man, you're not home! This is what it looks like here. Oh wow, look, there's a safety island! I wonder how old it is. It is from the time when this town was designed and built? I think so. I don't believe they built it recently, it's just unbelievable. Unbelievable how it could have happened. Yeah, well, here we go back to Russia again. Everything is littered with advertising. It's a patchwork of tiles, everything degrading. There's patches here and there. Over there, Finns did this culture center and it's still all fine, it looks fabulous. Here is just a patchwork quilt. It looks like they haven't been repairing anything here for decades. The sign marks a pedestrian zone and everything jammed with cars. There is some parking, advertisement, some kind of supermarket, so it's complete mess. And here you can look at the map of Kastamuksha. What do we have here? Cafes. There are a lot of different ones. Still, it would be good if they marked where we are with a you are here point, as it's not very clear. So here we have a finished nine-story building. What is interesting about it? First of all, the window size is not typical for Russia. At the same time, look, you see, they had some ventilation holes. Some people changed windows for plastic ones. The joint between the panels is just one finger wide and the panels are covered with a marble crumb. It is very nice and after 40 years the building looks very tidy and easy to clean. It looks clean and beautiful. The entrance has been reconstructed. There is a metal door and I think the fence would have a glass door instead. And here is a block where lifts and stairs are. Well, this is how the building looks like. Note that from afar it looks more or less tidy, in spite of everything. Around it, of course, everything looks a mess, because this is not Finland but Kastamuksha, so there is no asphalt here, but pits, filth and people park between the trees. But they have beautiful nature here and it would be possible to equip yourself a nice area. What else makes it all different from Finland? First of all, you see people have already started to change the windows. While the windows used to be big and beautiful, now people are putting in plastic windows. And the facade is already deteriorating. This is not possible in Finland. There the whole facade will be the same. And of course the courtyards. What is missing in the yards? Well, in Finland every yard will have a picnic area. Almost every yard. It could be some kind of gazebo, some kind of outdoor grill or something. 
They love to grill meat or something else. So there will be places for people to get together and have a picnic. Unfortunately, we don't have that. In the center there is a sports school for children and youth that is accessible from two houses through these see-through galleries. The galleries haven't been demolished and remain here to this day. In other words, you could go down to the ground floor without leaving the house and enter the gym through that gallery. The whole entrance group was preserved. I wonder why they didn't make grills here. Well, friends, behind me is a standard Soviet panel school. Feel the difference. And the difference is simple. You can see the size of the joints, the stairs are falling apart. And this is even though it's secondary school named after Russian famous author Pushkin. And you can see what it looks like here. Back there the joints were 1.5 1, 1. fingers wide. Here the whole three finger can fit. And ceiling is already falling apart. Looking sloppy. Now let's have a look at the Soviet panel houses and see what's going on with them. We just came out of the Finnish district and you can see our five-story buildings here. You don't even have to come up close, you can already see these house joints looking like an old country road. Some kind of licks, everything is falling off the panels, these tiles are flying off. Why does nothing like that happen with the Finnish houses? We are just comparing panel houses. The panel house built by the Finns 40 years ago and Russian panel house built around the same time. Another thing that bothers me is that we are now on the main boulevard by the looks of it. So that's like the local high street and it looks like the war ended the day before yesterday and they just haven't managed to build it yet. There are some kind of ditches, crates from shells, there are no pavements here at all, some kind of complete general destruction. What is going on here, I don't understand. Russians often like to be proud of their weapons, that they have some amazing guns, tanks, rockets, which can destroy the whole world and everything is so reliable and beautiful. But unfortunately we cannot be proud of our houses, because it's obvious that they were built of mud and straw, but with crooked hands. The difference in quality of construction, quality of finished materials and quality of work is very evident. They talk about some kind of mentality, bad climate, etc. But Kostomuksha was built by Finns and by our people. Houses are next to each other, 50 meters away. One house, even now, 40 years later, looks neat, beautiful, nice. While the other one just looks like a complete mess. This is not the typical concrete pavement in courtyards, by the way. Concrete pavements is often used in America, where there are concrete roads, concrete highways, concrete pavements. How is concrete fundamentally different from asphalt? First of all, concrete must have joints. So if you drive in America, you can feel the small joints just a tiny bit. Secondly, concrete, unlike asphalt, can be fixed as patches. If you have any destruction, you can repair asphalt covering fragmentarily, but the concrete covering doesn't allow it. If there is a pothole, you have to redo the whole thing. Concrete, on the other hand, is more durable and long-lasting. Therefore, there are several approaches, but in general, asphalt is used all over the world. Only some countries make concrete pavements and roads. Oh, there are Finnish five-story buildings. Let's cross the road and see what a Finnish five-story building looks like. Even from afar, you can see that the Finnish five-story building looks good. The entrance is completely see-through, which is how it was when the house was built. As you can see, there is nothing wrong with it. Nowadays, they put up metal doors and they often explain it by safety. People, for some reason, think that a metal door is safe, but it's actually the opposite. People think that these door windows will be smashed and so on. Well, as you can see in this house, not a single window is smashed, all of them are in place. And in terms of security, this entrance is much safer. Why? Because first, by approaching the entrance, you can see everything that is happening there. You can see that no one is standing there with a bat, that there is no junkie laying around, no one is 
is waiting for you here with an axe. We see the whole staircase and the same thing when we come out of building. When we go out, we open the metal door, we don't know what is going on outside. Everything is transparent here. It is this transparency that gives security. Such entrances are much safer than the solid metal doors that I installed. So friends, don't be afraid of see-through entrances, there's nothing wrong with them. They're beautiful, practical, convenient and safe. Friends, just look at how much cleaner and neater the fronts look here. The joints are again the size of a finger. Everything is neat, nothing falls off, there's no drips, there's marble chips, nice neat joints, all the panels fit properly, nothing's falling off. Beautiful. Even the stairs aren't falling apart either, nothing is falling apart. How do Finns do it? Maybe they just have a different attitude to people and think about them when they're building the houses. It's just amazing. When you look at the building from outside, it is obvious that something is not right. It's not Russia. Only Finns could have done this. I had a project about cities close to country borders when we traveled and compared different areas, including Russia and Finland. I didn't compare Karelia with Finland, I'll have to do it at some point. But we are comparing the Leningrad region with Finland and the difference is spectacular. And here you can literally walk across the street without crossing the border to see how it may look with right approach. Even decades later, a city can look different. Here we are, my friends, looking at kindergarten that the Finns built. Even decades later, it still looks great, with good architecture, good quality of construction, nothing shabby, nothing broken. It's a miracle. Look, you can even see the wooden windows. Yeah, yeah. It's a panel builder's paradise. There are even panel churches here. When driving in Kvili, you can often see cars parked along the roadside and people go out and pick something in the moors, some berries. Indeed, if you go out to the Karelian forest, you will see heaps of berries. People pick them and then there are collection points for berries. And it turns out that the near Kastamuksha there is a huge factory where they bring berries from all the nearby regions and here they are washed, cleaned, sorted, precised. And it turns out that the largest production of berries is located near Kastamuksha. If you live in Moscow, St. Petersburg and so on, you must have tried the berries from the factory as they are brought by yogurt, desserts, juices and jams producers. They are also selling them as export. Now we are going to see how it all works, because there is a Kavilian forest and just over there we have a factory that deals with berries. By the way, this factory was built by the Finns, like most of the buildings in Kostomoksha. That's where the pickers are, locals and tourists who come here to pick berries, bring them to collection point and purchase point and we buy them. How much does it cost? It's around 130 per kilo. A good average picker collects up to 100 kilos a day. That is, you can earn up to 130 dollars a day. Are those Lincoln berries or it's a mix of berries there? Some other ones here too? In North Karelia, long berries always grow together with blueberries. And how are they sorted? You'll see later, we sort them electronically. The berries are warm, they first have to cool down before the freeze. You see there is a label on each crate with supplier and then there is fresh lingon berries. The temperature in this chamber is 1-2 degrees Celsius, which cools the berries, removes excess moisture from the surface and prepares them for the freezing. Then there is a silk freezer. Sometimes we don't have time to defrost. Here the temperature is close to minus 40 and berries freeze and become crumbly here. Why do you have to freeze at this temperature? So that the ice crystals inside are small and that's what vitamins are. So we don't break up the cellulose and let all the vitamins stay in. This is purification facility. Frozen berries come into the line there and then there are a lot of different degrees of purification, sorting, there are a lot of cameras and from that flow you see that berries falling and that's where every pixel 
is analyzed. Objects are analyzed by different parameters, color, shape, and we sort by air. There is also an X-ray detector at the end of the line here to see if there is a stone or something. Here at the end of the line we have first class barriers which go to Germany, Italy, Finland, Russia every day. Cloud berries are the most expensive berries we have here. Yes, the purchase price is 6.5 per kilo. There's always juice that comes with cloud berries. You can automate the process of cleaning it so it's always juicing. We actually buy them clean, but our job is to get to the point where it can be used in the jam industry. Then we put the cloud berries with juice into these boxes with bags, freeze them, and get this kind of berry bricks. These ones are ready to leave the factory. How many cloud berries are there a year? The world market for cloud berries is 703,000 tons. Of those, 50-70% go through this facility. So you are a cloud berry monopolist? Yes, something like that. There's a lot of export, unfortunately, especially for cloud berries. I'd like to develop the Russian market as well. And how much of the cloud berries are exported? 90%. 90% are bought by Finns? Finns, Swedes, Norwegians. And then they sell them to Russian tourists? They have their own large consumption, but 30% are Russian tourists who come skiing in the week after New Year and take a jar of Finnish jam with them, and it's actually ours. Well, there is not a single producer of jam who wouldn't have bought cloud berries from us. So friends, we have reached the Kormilo Farm. It is a wonderful place, 50 kilometers from Kostomuksha. It's not easy to get here. The road is unpaved, but it's flat and good. The farm is in such a small paradise. It is situated on the shore of the lake and there are little cottages. Some are bigger, some are smaller. My house is meant to be for a single family, so we'll go inside now. But apart from that, there is a farm. There are alpacas, horses, cats, dogs, pheasants, chickens and there are even squirrels, but they ran away. Here they come, these cute dogs. Oh, good for you, you didn't get dirty so you can't be filmed. These are Samoyeds. We are sure that they will never hurt anyone. There is no kinder animal. My friends from Moscow came to us for a rafting trip and they brought these Kunia fowls so they could hunt and kill them somewhere on the rafting trip. But my youngest son and I set the alarm for 2 a.m. and I gave them moonshine in the evening. So they slept through the whole night. And we stole these guinea fowls, hit them and made it look as if they escaped. I don't know what to do with them now, so they are here. And the best part is there's amazing woods all around. There's a long road going in a different direction and it's just unbelievably beautiful. All these pines, stones, lichens, hills, real Karelian nature, which we all love and it's real pleasure to walk and relax here. Our farm is kind of a compromise or as everyone calls it now, glamping. Ours is not really a glamping site, but the idea is the same. People living in cities miss the nature. They want to go to the forest or seaside. They want to live on a farm, but they don't want to be deprived of conveniences. This is a house for a single family. What comes with it? It has an area with a perfect lawn. How do they get perfect lawns here? Because they are live lawn mowers, horses. The horses have heard you. What breed is this? We've been looking for a very long time for a horse breed that is not aggressive and we finally settled on these horses. They are called Tinkers and they are from Ireland. They have such an easygoing personality that we feel safe for our guests. They will never hurt anyone. The horse is incredibly cute. 
a standing horse that walks around and nibbles on the grass here. There also seem to be some goats and sheep. But judging by these tracks, the lawn here is being mowed in good order. There is a table, a grill, so you can cook yourself, grill kebabs, steaks, fish, whatever you like. There is a nice lake behind me, you can take a boat and sail around. You can also go fishing. Let's see what the house looks like inside. It's all made from wood. Here you have to take your shoes off. And here the actual room. I made a bit of a mess, but it's all right. This is the bed. Look at it. An amazing wooden master bed. Table, kitchen. The kitchen has everything you need. Fridge, microwave, most importantly, a real working fireplace. And upstairs. That's not all, friends. I can imagine what a thrill it is for the kids to climb upstairs where the kids can sleep. And the best part is, you have animals coming right into the house. I think if you like animals, if your children like animals, then this is the place to go. Because the animals are very kind. There are eight cats and kittens. They are totally tame and clean and go straight into the house. The dogs are gentle and playful, they are amazing. The alpacas are willing to meet new people. And the horses are the kindest I've seen. Again, I open the door and oh, what a cute kitty. Let's film you. Let's show ourselves. Gorgeous kitty. A fabulous cat that comes into your house. It's a pure ball of joy and happiness. What a good kitty. <laughs> Wait, Kitty, we need to film stories clip for Insta. How much does it all cost? The house I live in. A single family house costs $39 a day. And what's included in the price? A barbecue, a boat, a lodge, a gazebo. And the food? Food is separate. It is possible to eat at our place, as in full board, or to pick and choose. Breakfast is $3.25, lunch is $3.90, it's quite affordable. Pick and choose whatever you want, help yourselves with the food, everything is homemade. Guys, this is something you don't have, so just enjoy. Pie cutlets, cabbage, morals, potatoes and vendors. One can only envy. The farmstead owner's pride is his samovar museum. The family gathered this collection for 21 years, all of them are polished to shine. And most importantly, if you want to drink tea from an unusual samovar, you should come here. One of the samovars costs $6,485. This is a Malikov samovar. It is very famous among collectors. None of Malikov samovars are like any other. How much is it worth? Now, around $7,000. Wow, a samovar costs as much as a lot of Kalina. I think it's better than many lot of Kalina. A lot of countries make samovars. That's Germany, England, Ceylon, this is English samovar, Iran, Iraq, Turkey, China, the Caucasus, India. I like the one that looks like an egg. That's expensive too, by the way. It's very rare samovar, probably worth $4,000. It's called an Easter egg of yurt. You can talk about some of ours for ages. Morning run, friends. I got up at 8 o'clock in the morning and of course it is a blessing to run through such amazing places. Happiness beyond the reach of the city. Amazing air, sunshine. It's like 10 degrees warm. It's so cool in the morning. It is so good. I'm looking at these lingonberry bushes with dew glistering in the sunlight. There are pine trees, it's very beautiful.
Vaknavalak is an ancient rune-singing village. It was built in 17th century and since then all the old traditions, legends and runes have been gathered and kept here. There are over 200 houses in the village and about 500 inhabitants. The Karelians constitute about 85% of the population, so some still communicate with each other in the local dialect of Karelian language. In a big city it would be much harder to preserve it. The kids probably have PE outdoors now. That's a whole class in PE right now. That's a total of 30 students this year, 9 grades, no less 2 high school grades yet, but this is still considered a secondary and high school. There are three big buildings built here in 1998-1999. There were international projects when the Finns helped us build it. What is unique about this school building itself? First of all, every log is cut down by hand. If you take a closer look, the processing wasn't done by machines, but by hand, all with axes. And who built it? Fins. Well done, Fins! Yes, thanks to them. I wish we could build something like this somewhere too. There is no need to build a second one like this. Our school is the only one of its kind in Russia. There can be no analogs. It's very Karelian. It's the Karelian style. The walls inside aren't covered with panels either. It is actually very hoty. There is a special microclimate. Children feel very comfortable there. Unfortunately, we can't go inside because of the very strict restrictions imposed since yesterday. What do tourists do here? Here in Voknavalok? Traditionally, there are the usual guided tours through the village when the guests ask their questions. The locals hold workshops for the guests, make various souvenirs, traditional Karelian cousin, a folklore group holds interactive programs for the guests with games and round dances. The guests also visit interesting natural reserves, the Kiyonas Rift is nearby, Kalevala National Park is quite close to us. It's called Warren Square. It is the only historical part of the village that remained to this day. I want to tell you a little bit about this building. These barns were used for storing different utensils and food. In the summertime, youth and children could sleep in them when there were a lot of people in the house. Three of the barns had been brought from neighborhood and villages and they are also around 150 years old. They were brought here to save and create a historical ensemble here. We are going to visit this house, it's called Vochentala. It is interesting in that we don't have an exact year of when it was built. It was somewhere around 150 years ago too, but we know that in 1894 the famous photographer Inha Kondrat was here. He took about 200 photos and created a photo epic. There are some remakes, but the village is reconstructed with old photos. We try to recreate according to those 1894 photos. And in summertime we have some activities for guests with folklore group. If you come here, do you have to call in advance and book? Yes. What do people leave off? We have a trout farm, a fire station, a nursery on ground seedlings of pine and spruce. This is to reforest deforested areas. The women work at the school and at retirement home and the nursing station. Actually, there is a big problem with jobs. Some survive on mushrooms and berries. In autumn they actively pick berries, sell them and they leave of them. I'll definitely come back to Kareli again, to the places I've been before and to the places I didn't have enough time to get to. This is still a lot to see and do. I love to visit Marseille waters, it was the first Russian spa opened under Peter the Great. I'd go to Valaam and Solovki, see the biggest waterfall called Kivac. Go for a walk in the national parks or simply relax for a day in a tent on the shores of the lake. Everyone is strongly advised to go to Karelia, and I'd give a whole week if I were you. I guarantee that you will not regret it. So friends, come to Karelia. It's so nice here. It's time for us to go back because new journeys are waiting. Don't forget to post this video on Reddit and send the link to your friends on WhatsApp.